Et euh, il a aussi parlé de l'idée du consortium, comment est-ce que les femmes peuvent s'organiser. Il a surtout insisté sur euh, l'éducation des femmes euh, dans la science, c'est-à-dire de s'engager, et surtout les femmes africaines. Euh, euh, et aussi, un des objectifs qu'il a parlé de leur organisation, qu'est-ce qu'ils font euh, euh, ils s'engagent à aider les Africains dans le domaine de l'immigration, dans la philanthropie. Et bien sûr aussi pour finir, dans, dans sa conclusion, il a dit que nous avons besoin des docteurs, alors docteurs euh, africains, des docteurs femmes africaines, euh, PhD comme il l'a dit. Et, et bien sûr aussi encourager toutes ces femmes comme Janet, euh, des femmes africaines, vous qui, qui êtes dans l'auditoire, vous encouragez. Euh, encourager ces femmes, ces jeunes femmes euh, à s'éduquer. Et il a aussi dit quelque chose de très important, il a dit euh, euh, la richesse de la connaissance, surtout de la femme africaine, euh, que la richesse que nous devons, que nous devons avoir une richesse qui est la richesse de la connaissance de la femme africaine. Voilà, c'est le représentant qui l'a dit. Alors, euh, l'ambassadeur, la représentante de l'Union africaine, madame, euh, dans son allocution, il a euh, remercier les organisateurs, il a remercié euh, l'ambassadeur de la Côte d'Ivoire aux États-Unis, euh, leur partenariat, et depuis qu'ils se sont rencontrés en Amérique latine, que j'avais évoqué un peu plus tôt dans l'allocution de l'ambassadeur de la Côte d'Ivoire. Et il a surtout aussi euh, parlé de la famille de la diaspora africaine, comment la famille de la diaspora africaine doit travailler ensemble dans le domaine du développement. Il a parlé, euh, pardon, il a parlé aussi du leadership. Euh, 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 de la diaspora d'une façon générale et elle a aussi euh, salué M. Melvin euh, qui s'engage dans le développement de l'Afrique d'une façon générale elle a, euh, euh, pardon c'est Mel Forte, pas Melvin, voilà c'est ça je m'en excuse euh, elle a aussi euh, dit que l'Union africaine qu'elle représente ici aux états unis s'engage dans la coalition euh, que l'Union africaine croit à la diversité de la diaspora euh, l'Union africaine qu'elle euh, représente elle dit que la, doit, euh, que la diaspora doit être inclusive dans le développement de l'Afrique. Et elle a aussi parlé du rôle, de, du rôle essentiel que la diaspora joue. Et aussi pour rappeler, elle a parlé du sommet euh, que l'Union africaine et aussi les États africains ont organisé en Afrique du Sud le 25 mai 2012, en Afrique du Sud. Et, et elle a surtout aussi parlé de la combinaison, ou en tout cas, euh, la combinaison des Africains de la diaspora pour travailler ensemble et aider cette diaspora et aider aussi le continent africain dans le développement. Elle a surtout insisté aussi de la coopération, euh, de la coopération de réaliser ses objectifs. Et elle a aussi parlé que euh, la diaspora africaine doit avoir une seule voix, défendre nos positions, euh, les intensifier. Euh, Excusez-moi. Voilà. Et bien sûr aussi, elle a parlé de l'Union africaine, de la coopération politique entre les États africains. Elle a parlé du NEPAD, le plan d'action sur la santé sexuelle. Toutes ces organisations euh, qui ont comme pour ambition dans l'échange commercial et aussi l'échange commun. Elle a parlé aussi de ce forum euh, très important pour que, qu'ensemble, qu'on fasse entendre nos voix. Et aussi, elle a parlé euh, surtout qu'on insiste pour qu'on renouvelle euh, l'AGOA, l'échange commercial. Et, et pour finir, pour conclure, elle a parlé euh, que 2014 est l'année de l'agriculture et que généralement au mois de mai, on euh, c'est le jour de l'Afrique, alors il faut que tous ensemble, tous les Africains, qu'on euh, fasse des innovations euh, pour le développement euh, de l'Afrique et qu'on soit des partenaires. Et en conclusion, elle a remercié tout le monde, voilà, pour traduire euh, ce qu'elle a dit. Merci. Ok, je pense que c'est une unique opportunité de hear from the African Union's uh, uh, ambassador to Washington. So we wanted to take a, a few questions uh, from the floor. Uh, to Ambassador. So, uh, Dr. Kamal has uh, the microphone. And make sure some of the questions are from women, please. <laughs> Absolutely, it's, it's specifically for women. Uh, my name is Mohamed Tisse, and I'm an uh, Assistant General Deputy of uh, Ivorian Association of International Visitors of uh, the United States. It's just an uh, organization of uh, people who uh, benefit from uh, uh, the State Department program, Fulbright, Humphrey, and other leadership programs. Anyway, I have two questions. The first is for, uh, uh, how, what is that 
who spoke about the education. We know in the United States, opportunities are multiple for people to get education, meaning you don't necessarily need the government to fund you. The bank system is made in a way that you can you know, sometimes have some money to pay for your education, even if your parents don't have money. When and how are we going to see such the beginning of such programs in Africa? Because if the education has to be a uniquely government program, a problem, I'm not sure we're going to be able to give the amount of education we're looking for right now for women. That's my first question. What are the, stra the, the strategies and what are the tools or what are the projects that the government has for our brothers and sisters? My other question is uh, in regard to the African diaspora in the United States. What are the data today? How many Africans are in the United States? The percentage of men, the percentage of women. What are their progress in their school? How are we competing with Americans in school? How are we doing mathematics? How are we doing in science? What are our contributions in the, the huge, you know, booms of technology with uh, all these uh, new uh, softwares and uh, social network systems? What are the place of the diaspora in the United States? Thank you. Uh, I'll take a second question. My name is Emmanuel Mike, and I come from Eastport, Pennsylvania, to attend this forum. Okay. Okay. And uh, during your keynote uh, speech, you mentioned that cooperation and partnerships are the only way to foster development in Africa. Um, this is a very good place to be, and to know that there are many Africans also interested in, in the development of Africa. My concern is to come to have come here, spend time and go home and you know hear more about what we have discussed. My question then is how do we pull talents together? How do we connect organizations together to begin to do tangible things that are noticeable in Africa that will make people accountable and how we harness funds to be able to do that not only in one country but in various countries of Africa so that people from other countries like the western countries United States, Britain and, and so forth will be able to say yes this is what Africans in the diaspora have accomplished in any given year, and we are now ready to invest more funds into their activities. Thank you. Okay, let's take one from a woman if we have a woman. If not, you got to be a woman. You got to be a woman. You know? There's, there's right, one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Richardson. Uh, well, that's my baby name. My, uh, that's my main name, main name is Njai. So I'm um, usually, I'm from originally from Senegal. So I have been living here for over 17 years and I lived in Spain in four years prior to coming here. And I don't see any support in the uh, African community or at least I'm not involved. So I would like to say as an immigrant like me, you just call us like African diaspora family. So what are, or what would be the step to take? Where should I start? I have been living in, in the West, mainly in Europe and America, combining all together, it's like 20 years. Now I want to go home. I have my education. My children are grown, they like, they're 17. They're 17 years old, going to college next year. I have myself my uh, college education. And back home in Senegal, my parents were teachers, they still have school. Uh, my mom still run for daycare. Uh, it's a preschool in Dakar. So if I say I want to go home, how can I rely or relate to the African 
Christ for a time. When you are stuck, what is the beginning? When you are finding the tools or the connection, where you are beginning? Every time you go to a meeting, you are can hear people talk. I like to know where what's the call for action? It's going to have a meeting. It's going to go to the south. I go one hour to come here. When you are stuck, I want to go home. It's stuck to go home. Where do I begin? What are the tools? I don't see my identity. I don't see any help from the American uh, community or from the African community. What I see is very superficial. Today, I'd like to thank Mr. Shalvin who invited me here. And I'd like to thank my friend Annette, who was very kind to come from, with me here to address my concern. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay. Uh, I have uh, the final question since I'm the moderator. We call that moderator prerogative. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, she, the ambassador mentioned the, the Africa Union Summit, uh, the Diaspora Summit, which took place in South Africa uh, uh, two years ago. I happen to have been one of the delegates to that summit. And one of the ideals for jump-starting jump the relationship with diaspora were the set of, I believe, five legacy projects. And one of them dealt with the uh, uh, the volunteer corps, people who want to volunteer their services, support back to Africa. One was the Global Diaspora Marketplace, which CFA, in fact, uh, will be the point organization for coordinating, but the Global Diaspora Marketplace to encourage trade with, uh, you know, American or diaspora who are living in the West to actually do business in Africa. One was an investment portfolio. One was the African Remittance Institute. Um, you know, uh, which uh, recently was, uh, is going to take place in, uh, in Nairobi, is going to be the headquarters. And the fifth one uh, dealt with uh, uh, a, a diaspora database. And I would like to see the ambassador to uh, elaborate on those uh, legacy projects that have been uh, designed to jumpstart uh, the relationship with diaspora and the African Union. So, ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Mary, for giving me opportunity to being asked by brothers and sisters who are attending this forum today. And all these questions are very meaningful. And I hope my answer will really motivate you more to be able to give more for diaspora uh, engagement. <coughs> the first question with respect to education and uh, uh, my brother wanted to know if in Africa we have uh, opportunity for our young people to access education, especially higher, edu higher education in the sense that to, uh, to attend uh, universities and other tertiary uh, institutions. First of all, uh, I, I would just like to say that African Union, we, with collaboration of ministers of education, we had uh, a, a, a policy called uh, the African Decade for Education. And uh, the first decade ends, uh, I think, two years ago. And that decade really uh, put priority on uh, primary education and all other things that relate to primary education, for instance, teacher training, for instance, the curriculum uh, development and things like that. So, during the review of the first uh, ten decade, the first year, the first decade, we realized that we have done quite much better in that area. Of course, in terms of enrollment, you find many schools now they have attained maybe 98, 98, at least above 80 percent of primary school enrollment. That means many of our children that that have reached. Uh, a school joining age, at least now they can go to school in many countries in Africa. And uh, a lot of uh, plans and strategies to develop curriculum. In many countries, they develop curriculum and uh, also train in quite a big number of teacher, teachers for our primary school. Now, the problem can, during the second, second uh, uh, decade, which is this, we are now in the third year, the emphasis in that decade was to provide access to our children to university or institution of higher learning and uh, skills development institution. Because what we are saying, we want our children to be independent. When they finish school, they can even get employment 
by using the skill that they have. So now most of our government, I can say many of our government, maybe 80 percent of our government, they have a program now to build more universities, to uh, partner with other foreign international universities, to provide a different method of uh, funding for universities. And uh, in that respect, different countries, they, it varies from one country to the other, but there are countries that they have managed ready to, to push their children to go out to college because they provide facilities, for instance, funding facilities. From our neighbors in East Africa, I think my, my, my brother, Dr. Kimau, uh, Kamau, will support me. Kenya is doing much better than maybe Tanzania or other countries in East Africa. That's what, uh, an example because I'm coming from there. But they have a program to uh, support that, uh, uh, young people to join universities. You find them, many of them are outside uh, Kenya. And also in Kenya itself, the number of universities that we have in Kenya if you compare with Tanzania, it's only recently that Tanzania we have expanded in terms of numbers of university and in terms of quality. So, yes, we have these programs. But again, the problem is we have just started less than 10, 15 years ago, but we need a lot of funds, we need a lot of support, and we need also commitment from the family because sometimes the government can, can uh, decide to prioritize one of the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Subjects, for instance, they will say we are going to provide full scholarship for doctors and engineers, and this is what they are doing in many countries in Africa, giving full scholarship to a student who wants to join uh, engineering, the STEM, the STEM sector that uh, uh, Dr. Kamahu was talking about. But then you have other areas. These young people, they need to be supported because you can't live only for engineers and doctors, but you need other areas, be uh, expert in some other areas. So this is where you find the government cannot provide enough loan facility to be able to give to the student to join universities. And most of the time the family, because of the level of our income in Africa, most of us, the family can't support their children to be able to access those in, uh, sort of a higher education. But, uh, but when I was involved at that time, one thing was quite open, trying to compare between the U.S. system and uh, our system, because here, even here, you, when, you, you, when you listen to the debate that's going on, it's a question of expenses. It's very, very expensive here to, to educate anybody, whether you are diaspora or you are American. So there are different ways of funding, but still education is very, very expensive. Still in some countries in Africa, it's not very expensive. You can't compare between America and uh, Africa, Af some of the African countries. I know because my daughter, when she did a uh, 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 doctorate degree, I used to spend six million shilling that time, like three years, three years, four years ago. But here, to be able to train your daughter or your son for that same degree, you are going to go bankrupt because you cannot afford. So when well, we want to compare between our countries and the U.S., but we cannot because they have a different system. And also here they involve institutions, financial institutions. But in some of the country financial institutions, they would need government to provide sort of a, a collateral or something in case this student would not be able to come, or come back out of university. They disappear, they don't stay in their countries. So what's going to happen to the financial institution that provide the support to this student like a doctors, who are all doctors now going to Swaziland, going to Botswana, South Africa, and you find Kenyan doctors, and Zen doctors are moving there in big number because of the pattern of uh, payment and uh, things like that. But what is important is for a country, they know this problem and they are really now trying to move toward that direction so that many of our uh, young people will access higher education because we need to have experts. We need to build capacity for our people. We have resources, and now Africa is talking about 2063. But without having capacity, without, without having people who can go to, to start coming out with innovation, new technology, we cannot be able really to talk about development. So higher education is very, very important. And this, term, this is for the benefit of Dr. Kamau.
I will receive instruction only three weeks, three days ago, saying now you talk about Pan African University, you go back to the America and talk about STEM. How are we going to work with African Union in terms of STEM, especially for women? So maybe you can find for me, maybe Monday or whatever day, we can talk about it. University is something we know. But the problem comes from our recent uh, diaspora. Most of them, some of them, they are, they've come here legally to through uh, the, the institution of land, a higher institution, but some of them, they came through different, you know, different uh, ways. Some of them came as refugees. You know. So it was not easy so far to get all those information. But at the same time, to know what they're doing again is, is also is a problem. So what AU, when we realize that short, this is a shortfall for us to be able really to plan, because you need to have data to be able to plan. And there was a time when we were all pushing institutions like World Bank, like other partners in Europe, telling them now when you have a project, use our own experts who are in the diaspora. Instead of using our experts, why do you spend the money to your own, the same people? Whom already they are your own people. We need you to, you to fund the diaspora to be able to come and provide service to our countries. They gave us a challenge telling, where are the diaspora? They asked me <laughs> in terms of health, where are the doctors? Well, I need the names of the doctors so that they can, they, we, we can give them. That time we had malaria, rhotic malaria problem. It took us a while because even the embassies, for five years ago or six years ago, embassy didn't have information of the diaspora. It's only now you see ambassador now for like six, seven years ago, now, ambassador, uh, all the ambassadors now devote their time, talk with their diaspora, give them information and work together. So this is, as I said in my statement, that we have made very good steps, but still we have to do more. So in the legacy program, pro legacy project, we have a project on database to create a database. We wanted to do through my office, but then when the president decided to have a, a global database for the diaspora. So now World Bank is helping us to get funds to be able to have a database. And I told my, uh, soft, uh, Microsoft and uh, other uh, experts on that line, they've now started to prepare a sort of a, a project that will enable all of most of the diaspora to be in the database and to know what they are doing. It will be easier for our president when they come here and our expert and our, our uh, private sector to be able to know and to be able to tell everybody if there is if they need expert of particular uh, strength or skills. So, unfortunately, right now we have not started this project, but I think this project is what is going well, and uh, we will be able very soon to have the data to know how many are we. What we have, we have uh, just estimate which is not correct to use our 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 plan by using estimate. Now, the question from my brother from Pittsburgh, uh, this is on uh, uh, the concerns, his concerns about coming to this sort of meeting, if I, if I understood him correctly. What will be the outcome of this meeting? And uh, how do we harness this sort of energy that is here? You know, the energy that I'm seeing is palpable. We, we can touch the energy for diaspora. It's there, here and outside. We have this energy, but the question comes, we all like to do things on our own groups, individually or on our own groups. And this is the problem with our American diaspora. This is a problem. And in many meetings, many forums, many uh, sort of uh, opportunities that I get, I always talk to say, let's organize, let's be together like coalition. Because it's not easy to be talking to individual groups, but if you have a coalition, we are going to be very strong. Right now, if you want to talk to an, uh, an African institution that will give, let's say, I want an African position on some things, you can do it. When last year we had a program on uh, uh, extension of uh, third party uh, 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 program for, for textile, we were not able to send our people to the Congress because we are, as I said, we work as an individual capacity. But I believe this organization, because this is the first, now you are starting this organization, now you have heard what is the problem, please, let's start to work as a team. We have all those uh, organizations that are under this umbrella. We can sit down and, and design a program, particularly to address issues that concern for us. 
For instance, the sister there, she was talking about going back home. But if we have a, 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 a well-prepared plans and programs, we would know what are the job availability in Senegal, what are the job availability in the West Africa. Now we have ECOWAS. ECOWAS can, 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 can uh, give uh, opportunity for anybody from ECOWAS to be employed anywhere in, in the block. But she doesn't know about this. But also the opportunity in the universities. There is an uh, association of um, African University in Ghana. And that give, can give information about where we need uh, uh, lecturers or assistant lecturers, in, what part, in particular, in what areas. So I think what is required to organize ourselves, but at the same time, let's work strategically. Because you find also there are like duplication of our work. Yes, it's good, the more we do things, it's good. But at the same time, when we do the same thing, repeating the same thing, and then sometimes we argue the same issue without really planning the outcome, that is also a problem. So I think what is needed, and this is a weakness that we have, the diaspora here in, in, in uh, US. Only two days ago, I was talking to somebody, one of the organizers sent books in Africa. We were talking about it's just books. And he told me, he said, Ambassador, you know, sometime when we go to this institution to ask for books, we find our Indian uh, diaspora are already there. They took all the books and they finished. <laughs> or sometimes you tell me, when you go and we find our Latino uh, uh, diaspora, they are already there. We talk about uh, equipment, like Atlanta, they provide the, uh, their own used equipment, but they are good for Africa. But he was telling me, sometime when you go, you find other diaspora already took all the things. Why? Because they are well organized. One day I passed through uh, somewhere in the uh, Virginia area. I found a big building talking about Latino. It was, it was a financial institution for Latino diaspora. And I said to myself, and I, I, had, I was fortunate to have the chairman of the Latino diaspora in the U.S. And he was in our office. Mel, you know, I told you once about this. He was in our office when we were in, in, in one of the buildings here in, in Washington. And I asked him, I called him, I said, tell me what happened. He used to come and exchange ideas with me. I asked him what happened. He said, yes, we are all like organized. Then to see, we, we come out with one strong position. So he asked me, what about you, Africa? So I, I didn't have answer because we are not organized. So I think the message that I want to leave with us here, yes, we have worked hard. We have attained a certain level of success. But I think now we really have to find a new paradigm. You know, find a new, because a new paradigm, we have to find the new strategies that would enable us to hit where it is needed. If you don't do that, at the end of the day, we will be again uh, divided. And people who are divided, you are not strong. Let's be strong and really push our agenda. And this I answer my sister. Yes, you can go back home. There are opportunities back home. I know Ghana is a very successful success story. Now, Nigerian, a lot of young women are going back to Nigeria to work there. They believe there are opportunities in Nigeria. Even Tanzania, they are also working, going, but they told me, said, no, no, it's better to go back home. Most of our embassy staff now, they are going back. The young ones, they are going back. Even said, oh, I said, no, 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 it's better to go because if I go home earlier, then I will be there earlier than others. So, you, you know, there are opportunities, but we don't know about this opportunity. And our embassies also don't provide those opportunities. But the embassy, you have to tell the embassy, please find information, let us know what are the opportunities. When you go back home, I, I did my education, I want to go home, what are the opportunities? Okay, you don't get a job, but you can also look at possibility for, to start a, a venture, business. Private sector is thriving now in Africa. University. And I'm also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science at uh, USAID. And um, the title of the, uh, the session today is Looking for Opportunities to Partner. And I'm going to focus on what we've been doing in my office at USAID to support partnerships between scientists in the US and scientists in Africa, specifically. Um, many times what we find is the pool of scientists who we partner together draw heavily on diaspora. So, just, next slide. So just keep, 
So that just shows an example of a scientific collaboration um, in Kenya, my research team with a team at Kenyatta University, where we're looking at surface quality, uh, surface water quality issues. And the purpose of the USAID program that I'll briefly mention here in the history of time is to support the Kenyan collaborator to have resources to fund the scientific collaboration. So as many of you know, USAID is a technical bureau that has regional uh, bureaus, uh, is, a, is a technical agency that has regional bureaus and um, pillar bureaus. And the Office of Science and Technology falls in the in the US Global Development Lab. So this is an entity that is prioritizing science, technology, and innovation partnerships. So using a new approach to supporting both institutional and human capacity building in the science and technology space in Africa in particular, Latin America, and of course Asia. So the program that I'm going to uh, present to you is the Partnerships for Enhanced Engagement in Research here, but I just want to put uh, this slide up here to show you that there are other efforts ongoing at USAID that specifically are focused on supporting the science and technology enterprise in Africa through many different mechanisms. So the the peer program supports scientific research collaborations that have impacts in the area of development that has been identified as that by that country as a priority. So the program itself is funded by USAID in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, and the implementing partner of this program is the National Academies. So, the benefits of this program to the US uh, scientist, who often is themselves a diasporan, is that it opens up the scope of research that they're able to do. Um, and for diasporans such as yourselves, the opportunity to actually have a mechanism by which you can engage in your scientific work um, is enticing through this program. For the um, African partner or the international awardee, um, this program provides an opportunity to essentially fund scientific research, whether it's through uh, grants for graduate students or instrumentation um, or even travel awards between the US and um, the partner country. Um, the USAID missions, so these are the country offices, are also involved in this program and this provides an opportunity for those scientists on the ground to work closely with USAID. So there's a whole range of areas in science that are supported by this program from biodiversity all the way to um, ecology, diet, uh, disaster mitigation, food security, energy, and others. So, um, I'm originally from, I'm from Kenya, and this has nothing to do with my being from Kenya, the fact that there are eight camps. <laughs> This, this day has preceded my arrival to the office. <laughs> um, and, and so there's, there's a whole range of you know, countries, uh, Kenya and South Africa seem to keep showing up uh, very often um, as being competitive. So examples of programs, and I'm just going to stop here, um, that have been successful. Um, scientific research in the area of uh, water quality um, climate change questions as they relate to freshwater um, research in Senegal, um, food nutrition, 
and food security questions as evidenced by the research in Nigeria. We also have um, soil uh, uh, and water conservation uh, research in Ethiopia and our capacity building um, from the pedagogical point of view is a project that's uh, being funded in Tanzania. So I think that's my five minutes of the briefs there. Okay. be here today, I want to thank Jeanette and Pius and the uh, ambassador um, and uh, for the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, I represent today the Department of State of the United States and I'm here for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, um, as uh, Pius pointed out, the U.S. Department of State has recognized the importance of diasporas. Uh, former Secretary Hillary Clinton started the Global Diaspora Forum several years ago, and we've had several fantastic meetings bringing diasporans together from around the world, um, because we know how important those are in building cultural relationships and in um, powering the economies of both the United States and nations around the world. And I represent the Department of State because I am in the Office of the Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary. And that office added value to the Global Diaspora Forum by starting a partnership called NODES, the Networks of Diasporas in Engineering and Science. So what we've done is focus on engineering and science diasporas, those members of countries around the world who have come to the United States and have specific expertise. And I want to take a minute to say why is that important? We know that diasporans are here and, uh, for example, they often are multilingual. They're able to come to the U.S. They're resourceful. They're smart. They're persevering. And they're here because they, they've been able to leave their countries, come here, and succeed. What are science diasporas? They also bring scientific expertise. And it's that science expertise that can perhaps be used to help develop, to foster economic growth, to solve the problems in their countries of origin and around the world. They have access to information technology, which enables them to communicate. They are often, if they're in universities, they're teachers. So they're extremely good at this kind of communication. They often are very good at writing grants, because they get grants for their, fund, for their science. They have access to equipment that might be shared. They have what we call bicultural dexterity. And I mean that in several cultures, because they can bridge science cultures and regular cultures. So I will keep it very short and simply say that um, I will leave brochures out here uh, about nodes, uh, the program, that, uh, the project that we have with the, um, the AAAS, the American Association of the Academies of Sciences, and two of our national academies, where we try and bring together diaspora groups, science diaspora groups, learn from them, network, and then share that information. I will also say, that if you haven't seen it, this, which was actually put out by a group in Ireland called the Global Diaspora Strategies Toolkit, is the most valuable document that I have found. It, ha it engaged about 30 different countries, including several in Africa, to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what can the countries do, what can the diaspora groups do. So I recommend this highly. And finally, because I'm a scientist, I'm going to talk about a few of the things that we have learned. I'm a problem solver. I'm a diplomat, but I'm also a scientist. So what is it that we've seen works in diaspora groups? First of all, finding your people. Because it is, as the ambassador said, about people. And I was delighted to hear about this legacy project of finding the people. But beyond finding the people comes the skills inventory. What can they do for you? Who can do a business plan? Who can help on IT? Who can do many of meet some of the needs back in the countries of the origin? I would say learning from other diasporas groups is essential. And so this book and some of the sessions that we've had at the Global Diaspora Forum allow diaspora groups to learn from each other. I would say leveraging other institutions, business, but also universities, professional societies. There's a whole set of different groups who have not the exact same objectives, but they too want to build those bridges. So leverage those when you can. Use IT. 
Use digital means, however. You've probably heard about MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courseware. I would love to see courses for Africa developed by diasporans. And finally, one of the clear things that we have seen is that support from institutions in the country of origins is extremely important to the success of these diaspora organizations. So I'm heartened to see so many folks from different embassies and government organizations because they are essential partners in building these, these diaspora networks that are so valuable. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll start talking since time is short and hopefully the slides will come up. I'm actually a professor at the University of Florida and my background is in a combination of architecture and engineering. So this is me like stepping out of my comfort zone a little, but there's a good reason for that. <laughs> Sorry, if you can help with the slides. Um, the area that I'm focusing mostly is on adequate housing. Um, as I said, I'm in architecture and, in, and engineering. And most of the things that have been done, you know, reflecting on what my professors at the University of Nairobi, Kenya did when I was a student there, we look at it as a, as a human rights issue that everybody needs to have access to adequate housing. But if we go to the next slide, it is actually a very important economic development factor. We all remember from the real estate property market crashing in the US and what happened. And this is the same thing in any other part of the world. I look at these problems at a global scale. I look at it, but the problems are the same with whichever country you come from. And uh, these are just some examples, some numbers that I pull off of the US database. And they are very similar to the numbers that I would have for Kenya. You know, if you look at what the economic development in terms of employment, the construction industry and real estate is contributing significantly. If you look at things to do with contribution to the GDP, it's a significant contributor. If you look to, the last thing I put there was bankruptcy, because when the companies go bankrupt, people lose their jobs. The GDP is affected. So housing is more than just a human right. It is very important to provide adequate housing because it's a basic human right. But it is also important to look at it broader, in a more broader basis. It's not just an architectural or a design thing, it's an economic development factor. Next slide, please. These are just direct data that I put out there just to see, you know, to show you that this is the reason why I look at it as a global problem. It manifests itself differently in different countries, but pretty much the problem is we have urban poverty. Whether you are in the US or Kenya or India, there's an urban poverty problem. Next slide, please. And uh, some of the efforts that I was alluding to earlier, I've been working very closely with my professors at the University of Nairobi. I left Kenya in 99, but I'm a regular visitor, and I work with them to, you know, we work very well to a point where I actually have their permission to be out here. They told me that, you know, when I told them, hire me, they say, no, you stay out there. We need you out there. As long as you keep coming back and working with us, we are happy to have you here. But these are some of the frustrations that they have. <coughs> Two of my close collaborators were heavily involved in this project. So when I do a Google search and I see things like this coming up, there were efforts to upgrade the Kibera slums in Nairobi, which is reported as the largest slum in Africa. And a lot of effort in terms of both money and expertise went into this. And now it seems like it's about to stall. And uh, I'll deviate away from the slides for a minute because I'm gonna run out of time. I've done a lot of traveling collaborating with different people in different parts of the world, and it's the same story, that an architect will leave the US, go to Ghana, yeah, build homes for 5,000 people, money runs out. Yeah? You go to India, same thing. You know, the number that we are hitting is very small. If it is a social problem, if it's, there is an adequate housing human rights aspect, and there's also an economic aspect, you know, delivering houses at volumes of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 is not going to address the deficit. Going back to Kibera slums in Nairobi, it's estimated that we have about a million people. Depending on who you believe, some people will put it at 2 million, and they say that by 2050 we'll have 3 million people. Yeah, if we keep giving them 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 units every single year, we are never going to close that gap. So I'm, I'm working in a team that involves, you know, collaborating with different U.S. universities. I'm collaborating with some universities in Mexico and research institutions in Mexico. I have a collaborator in India. 
and we're trying to look at this thing, you know, the, are there models that can be scaled up? How do we hit the big numbers? And if we just fast track. Yeah, oh yeah, this is important. So the things that I'm doing, we look at it at a multidisciplinary issue because there are very many different things that just me locking myself in my laboratory with my students, we're never going to be able to address. So this is a subject which you know does require not just a global perspective, but a highly multidisciplinary perspective. Next slide. Yeah, so these are just examples. You can slide through them quickly. Or some of the questions that we've been able to answer, you know, from an engineering and architectural perspective, you know, hazard mitigation. Next slide. I can provide this information via email later on, but we do work in the laboratory. I have students even right now, you know, I have two PhD students looking at these issues. Workmanship, that was me in India. I went there because, you know, I look at the issues from a white collar perspective and I wanted to look, you know, the people who are actually doing the construction, is there any way we can get them to move faster so we get more than 10,000 houses in one year? That was no. <laughs> Let's go on. Then I went to Mexico, you know, because they are classified as an emerging economy and I was like, you know, maybe they are doing something right with adequate housing. And then again the answer was no. On the right, just go back to the previous slide. On the right, on, I think that's your right. That's a picture of one of the houses that the research institution I collaborate with has put up as a demonstration unit, and it's great. You know, they're using solar power. You see solar panels. They try to reclaim the water. They're doing all these things. Um, but when I looked at their price tag, that's ten thousand U.S. dollars. That's not a house for a poor person anywhere. Ten thousand dollars is very expensive. So we have two problems. The cheapest house, even in Nairobi will be around that range, 10,000 US dollars. The numbers are not right in terms of volume. Next slide. So I happened also to work with Mexico, Semex Mexico, and you know, I started seeing this as a financial problem. There's an engineering problem, there's an architectural design problem, social problem, political problem, but there's also a money problem. I'm actually in New York at the moment doing my sabbatical there, and that was like my eye-opening moment because I was like, we don't have money. Guess who has money? Wall Street. So <laughs> I've started getting now into, let's move quickly, into social enterprise and just looking, next slide, looking at the things like examples of projects that are being done by MIT at the dealer. That was me at one of their recent events. And you know, how can these models be translated into adequate housing? You know, building on all the other multidisciplinary things that we're doing. And CIMEX is actually doing a lot of this already in Latin American countries. And then CIMEX actually, this is another thing. CIMEX acquired Drinka, an example of why it is important to look at these things from a global perspective. CIMEX is a Mexican company. They grew huge to the point that they've become a giant in the US. Next slide. Kenya is not insulated. Foreign companies are going there, meaning that these issues really need to be looked at as a very broad global perspective because if you're not looking at what the other countries are doing, guess what? They're looking at what you're doing and they are coming there to become a dominating force. Next. Yeah, this is an example of one of the projects which I did in collaboration with my students, and actually this is where it all began for me. And I was lucky. I got some money from Libby's program in the NSF, and I went with my students to Kenya. And um, they learned from me, we learned from the people there, and I also learned from my students. So I am very, very passionate about, you know, integrating every single thing I do with my students as well. The one who is over there all the way at the left, as a result of this program, he actually got into one of the big engineering companies and his uh, deployment is in global operations. This is a kid who, before he went with me to Kenya, he had not stepped outside Florida, 21 years old. And because of being exposed to adequate housing and economic development issues related to, it, to this, he was able to get a job, you know, demonstrating exactly what I was saying before, that the problems need to be looked at at a very broad level. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll skip that. So I put one foot in the business school. That's what that slide is. <laughs> in conclusion, yeah, in summary, adequate housing challenge has to be a global societal problem. And I see professors, people like me, people in diaspora who are in the university system being uniquely positioned to play this role of bridging all these systems, yeah? Because it's easy for me to move around to other universities. It's easy for me to move around to other countries as well. And because there's no time, I'll stop there. Next slide, acknowledgement. 
Next slide. Thank you to all those people who've given me money. And if you have money, give it to me. <laughs> Um, I like to start my remarks with a comment that is attributed to a Scottish king. Every time you receive a new wife, you tell her, "Don't worry, I won't keep you long." <laughs> uh, so, um, from what I've, we've heard so far, we've heard the beautiful gospel of the diaspora, and I like to really uh, be the first notes in this beautiful gospel of the according to the diaspora. Uh, because like in all human institutions, there's always some good and there's always some bad. So as a political scientist and professor, I'd like to throw in a little bit of the good notes, a bad notes, so that we can you know, have some food for thought. Uh, the, first of all, let's start with some definitional, uh, uh, some conceptual clarity. Apparently, the word diaspora refers to the scattering of people from an original place to different places. So, um, and there's some, you know, uh, uh, seminary, uh, seminary uh, diaspora, like the Jews, diaspora, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now, um, as I said, there's some excellent things the diaspora can contribute to, and all the beautiful experts have been saying that. Uh, my comment on a little bit of a negative and cautious side is brought to me uh, from reading a recent book, I'm not done reading the book, but it's called uh, The Tyranny of Experts. Uh, the, uh, the author is uh, William Easterly. Uh, but, uh, again, I'm going to brush that a little bit aside. But the, it, the, in French, there is a beautiful co contrast between two words that captures the good and the bad side of diaspora. Okay, we use the word diaspora, but there is also a word uh, uh, that is created by some Africans. It's called the diaspora. You know, there's a difference between the diaspora Good, a good portion of the members of the diaspora, the, the beautiful contribution they can make, but there's also diaspora, which is the bad thing that the diasporas can do. Now, <clears throat> where I want us to think a little bit about the dangers that may be associated with the contribution the diaspora can make is... Let me just take a few brief moments to... Uh, mention an organization called the Pan-African Collective. I think one of the things that Mel and I both know and agree, and many of you would attest to, that particularly within the African-American community, there is still a tremendous lack of uh, awareness about Africa and also a tremendous lack of involvement with Africa. But yet on the same hand, within the black church community, for example, there is a captive audience every Sunday morning in this nation of approximately 15 million black Americans coming to a place of worship. And through the Pan-African Collective, working with a number of the members of not only the African diplomatic community, but also our colleagues and friends in the Caribbean, uh, that we have made it a point of reaching out to them, including people like Ambassador Ali, uh, to come to our places of worship so that they have an opportunity to be able to share with literally hundreds if not thousands of black Americans on a Sunday morning more about Africa. And so uh, that has worked very well over the last 10 years, but not only that, but we've also brought uh, public high school students from Prince George's County, predominantly black, uh, to the uh, embassies here so that they too can learn. And in effect, we say to them, you'll have an opportunity to visit Cote d'Ivoire or visit uh, Nigeria. And in that instance, it's by coming to the embassy. But we're hoping to therefore plant seeds so that ultimately they would find their way literally getting on a plane and visiting those nations. What we have found by having monthly meetings of the Pan-African Collective at Greater Mount Nebo, and I'll leave my card at the church where I pastor so that you can learn more, and we invite you to come whenever you wish uh, to those meetings held normally on the third Saturday of each month, and we certainly have had members of the uh, diplomatic corps to join us. But going back to what I said about those people housed in those churches every Sunday, we have people that are engineers, scientists, uh, people that are skilled in the, the agricultural sector, doctors. And so as a result of that, we desire to find ways to link people from the churches, from the African-American churches, with many of you to be able to affect change on the African continent. And so there's a very strong way for us within the faith community to partner 
to really foster greater African development. So again, I'm going to leave my cards with my telephone number if anybody wishes to be in touch with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, we're going to now move to uh, Reverend uh, Jeffrey Bowden. We have about 15 minutes, so that's why I'm really pressing. And I want to make sure we hear from all these speakers. Uh, we are, we're not doing justice to them for sure. So we're already thinking about a follow-up conference. So, Reverend. <laughs> Okay, um, mine's going to be short, but I think you all can relate to the situation that took place during the memorial service for Madiba Nelson Mandela and the gentleman who was able to gain access to the podium to be able to, uh, what he thought was sign language interpreting, but actually was perpetrating a fraud. Uh, there's key things that I want to talk to you about in regards to that. While it may have been a national embarrassment and a critical security risk, I'm asking a deaf, imagine a deaf person experiencing that every day of their life. A interpreter without the skills, without the language background, attending to them in a medical situation, delivering a baby, seeing about a sick parent or a sick child. Imagine a child going to a school and while the rest of their classmates are learning math and English, geography, this student is not learning anything because the interpreter doesn't have the background and linguistic skills to interpret clearly. And so now that deaf child fails to rise to the highest level of their potential. Also in the area of employment. Because if you don't have good health and you don't have good education, then where are you going to go when you find a job? So what I'm about here with United Deaf Ministries is to go to Africa and provide training, workshops, seminars, and conferences. The gateway to those communities are also in the kind of the faith-based perspective. Many interpreters who are interpreting in churches on Sunday are the same interpreters that a deaf person may approach to go to an doctor's appointment or to a counseling session. That interpreter who is not doing a good job in church won't do a good job on Monday. So our point is this, as you reach out towards reaching into economic development, architectural development, let's also think about the disabled community and especially in my particular niche community, the community in which sign language and deaf people reside. Thank you very much. By the way, this is his presentation. You all need to get a copy of this. And uh, uh, you know, it's a whole different perspective on it, but uh, very. Uh, I want to now call on uh, Dr. Davey uh, Rodema Taylor, uh, who come a long way to, to speak with us, please. Okay, um, I want to thank the um, uh, organizers and participants of this forum and it's a pleasure being here today. Um, now, I'm a social anthropologist and an Africanist and my research in Africa has concentrated on the topics of informal cooperation, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship development, um, indigenous financial management and also migrant remittances and financial inclusion issues. Um, I would like to um, provide um, here, to talk here about um, migrant remittances, particularly in post-conflict contexts, as um, they are shown to play um, a crucial role in post-conflict reconstruction and development. However, the dynamics of conflict induced remittance flows and the possibilities of lever leveraging remittances for post-conflict development have, very, have been very sparsely researched up to now. So our Boston University Interdisciplinary Task Force on Remittances in Post-Conflict States was convened to systematically investigate a wide range of issues central to conflict-induced remittance systems and uh, we came up with a collaborative research report, Remittance Flows to Post-Conflict States, uh, Perspectives on Human Security and Development. So our research established that remittances can act as a gateway to greater financial inclusion while also providing crucial post-conflict stability. And uh, drawing upon existing networks of social support and interacting with a variety of institutions Remittance flows enable multi-scale connections between diverse organizations and foster innovation and empowerment. Next slide, please. Um, well, um, 
uh, there have recently also been important changes in the mechanisms and social consequences of violent conflict. Uh, conventional war between nation states has gradually been replaced by a more chaotic and complex dynamic of violence, also more fragmented and uh, recurrent dynamic that includes various criminal activities, trafficking, terrorism and chronic civil unrest. The changing nature of violent conflict has also created a need to reconceptualize research and policy approach, approaches to post-conflict settings. Um, and um, uh, increasingly it has become clear that these are the weak state market and social institutions that are primary factors in contributing to chronic unrest and violence. And therefore, one of the main reasons of that fragility is also low priority given to uh, rebuilding of national institutions. Um, attention to sustainable institution building instead of mediating conflicts between distinct parties uh, has therefore uh, become a primary focus in uh, uh, peace building and um, also it necessitates attention to broader settings that can provide security, justice and economic sustenance to individuals as well as communities affected by crisis, which is reflected in the human security approach that guided our research. Um, in general, um, it can be said that post-conflict situations are characterized by endemic breakdown of central governance and banking institutions and most conflict-induced remittances, next list, are therefore characterized by informal channels that are embedded in existing social institutions and networks, as well as norms of obligation and reciprocity. These informal channels, however, may frequently be hidden and obscure, posing um, um, serious challenges to uh, their integration into formal sector financial institutions. At the same time, also remittances have a potential to become a major tool for financial inclusion by establishing durable links between formal and informal sectors and building on local coping mechanisms, entrepreneurship and creativity. Although formal banking uh, infrastructures are often lacking in post-conflict situations, it was noted that modern informal remittance transfers can involve complex connections to diverse formal sector institutions. The so-called traditional informal modes of transfer, like Hundi and Havala, for example, draw upon complex global networks of financial nodes of very varying degrees of formality and are therefore characterized by an increasing hybridity and mixing of formal and informal elements. Therefore, we suggest that rather than focusing on the arbitrary formal informal opposition, Attention is needed to the processes of institutional evolution and development whereby remittance institutions may evolve and build upon other social institutions and practices. Therefore, partnerships are very relevant with a wide range of institutions of financial inclusion oh, next place, that include microfinance groups and credit unions, um, cooperative marketing associations, post offices, mobile banking platforms, uh, local rotating sales credit groups and economic groups. And today we also heard um, in the earlier presentations some challenges of linking those non-bank institutions effectively to migrant remittances and, other broad, and integrating them into a broader framework of financial inclusion and these are the issues that need to be uh, followed up on. Now, um, coming back to the post-conflict context, um, it has to be said that migrant remittances often serve as the most important source of survival in conflict-affected and post-conflict societies, and they are crucial for sustaining local livelihoods during transitional periods when minimal formal sector jobs are available and most economic activities are informal in nature. The activities of the diaspora often have a potential to profoundly impact the development of entrepreneurship and community development.